Digital. Alaska, 1976. The welders from Oklahoma were ready to quit. The last thousand feet of the Alaska pipeline had to scale an almost sheer cliff. It looked impossible. And no one was willing to risk his life on that rock face. Until the oldest man on the job volunteered. I was scared. Man, everybody else was scared too. But I was gonna go if I lost my life. After so many of them tell me it can't be done. On the Alaska pipeline, there was always something that couldn't be done, that had to be done. It was an 800-mile steel pipe through the heart of America's last untouched wilderness. The biggest, most expensive, and most controversial private enterprise in American history. There were times when you felt just militant about it. Yeah, oh, let's just blow this thing up, you know, let's make it stop. It was like a gold rush. We had people from almost every country and from every walk of life. Plus, along with that, you had gamblers and crooks and uh, ladies of the evening. I mean, everybody who could had some piece of that pipeline. This was not about details, man. It was about muscle. I don't care what it takes, do it. That was a pretty good answer to money questions. It was a pretty good answer to environmental questions. It was a pretty good answer to political questions. I don't care what it takes, do it. And the evidence would suggest they didn't care what it took, and they did it. American experience is made possible by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation to enhance public understanding of the role of technology. The foundation also seeks to portray the lives of the men and women engaged in scientific and technological pursuit. At the Scotts Company, we help make gardens more beautiful, lawns greener, trees taller. If there's a better business to be in, please let us know. Imagine what the world would be like if everyone did the right thing. Responsibility. What's your policy? American Experience is also made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. On April 22, 1970, 20 million people marched in cities across the U.S. in the first Earth Day demonstration. A movement building for years had reached critical mass. Now, they were ready to fight. The timing could not have been better for the new environmentalists, or worse, for the oil industry which was on the verge of launching the biggest private construction project in history, in America's most pristine wilderness. Two years earlier, Atlantic Richfield struck oil at Prudhoe Bay on Alaska's North Slope. It was a massive strike, the largest oil field ever discovered in North America. Other oil companies joined in and started drilling their own wells. The biggest problem anyone could foresee was how to get 10 billion barrels of oil out of Alaska. There wasn't even a road within 400 miles of the wellheads. The Arctic Ocean was frozen solid most of the year. The oil companies considered ice-breaking tankers nuclear-powered submarine tankers and 12-engine jumbo jet tankers. Eventually, they agreed that the only practical solution was a pipeline. The shortest route would run 800 miles to the heart of Alaska, 
from Prudhoe Bay on the northern coast to the port of Valdez in the south, equivalent to building a pipeline from Minneapolis to Oklahoma City, but with an Arctic wilderness in between. It was countries so wild, some of it had never been mapped. The pipeline would cross three mountain ranges, 800 streams and rivers, and some of the world's most active earthquake zones before reaching the ice-free water in the south. It was an audacious plan, even for the oil industry. The industry was somewhat beyond confident, but they had the know-how and the money to solve any engineering problems they encountered they believed. And when you think of that kind of, of confidence, it, it does border on arrogance and, and it does border on hubris given what happened next. In February 1969, the oil companies announced their pipeline plans. They ordered $100 million worth of steel pipe from Japan. The project would cost $900 million, they said, and be finished by 1972, even though they did not yet have a single design drawing or construction permit. They had no concept how this thing would be built, and yet the industry was ready to lunge ahead. Don't worry, folks, we're taking every precaution, leave it to us and everything will be fine. And besides, you couldn't possibly stop us. You couldn't possibly slow this thing up. It's too big. We need the oil, we're going to get it. Stuart Brandborg, director of the Wilderness Society, decided to lead the fight against federal approval of the pipeline, much of which would cross public land. I saw no recourse. If the environmental movement hadn't challenged the pipeline, we would have ended with uh, damage beyond any description. Native Alaskans were also alarmed. Ever since the Alaska Purchase in 1867, they'd been waiting for Congress to settle their ancestral land claims. They were still waiting in 1969 when the native leaders of Stevens Village heard about the pipeline. Stevens Village was located directly in the proposed path of the pipeline. And the people of Stevens Village uh, said, we can't let this happen, that until our claims are settled, until we have certainty about what we own and what we don't own and how this will affect us and our children, we can't allow this to happen. While Earth Day demonstrators took to the streets in April 1970, Native Alaskans and environmental groups both sued in federal court and won, stopping the pipeline until their concerns were addressed. Now, Native Alaskans had leverage they'd never had before. Suddenly, the game changed. The Alaska Native community went from the prospect of settling our land claims for mere pennies an acre to no land to very quickly what we were able ultimately to achieve, 44 million acres of land and a billion dollars. Environmentalists also had newfound leverage, thanks to the National Environmental Policy Act, which had just been signed into law. NEPA required the government to evaluate environmental threats and alternatives before authorizing any project on public land. And environmentalists could challenge the results in court. In 1970, suddenly, the environmentalists weren't just talking from the outside. They had some new weapons and some new power and some new standing to, to push over, to, to bridge the gap and say, in your construction proce process, you are going to have to listen to new demands. Environmentalists used the law to force studies of everything from caribou migration in the far north to fish spawning in the streams and rivers the pipeline would cross. They pushed for detailed plans to limit pollution from construction camps, prevent oil spills, and survive earthquakes. One legal challenge followed another, 
as environmental groups tested the limits of the new law. Years passed, with the pipeline stuck in legal limbo. Not everyone in Alaska wanted the pipeline, but many were counting on it for an economic boost and blamed outsiders for meddling in their business. Environmentalists were painted in very dire terms. I can remember the Anchorage Times once describing someone in an editorial as being a, an admitted environmentalist. Howard Weaver grew up in Alaska and was a reporter for the Anchorage Daily News during the pipeline years. People in Alaska really thought that the psychic benefits of somebody in Iowa or Boston who's never going to come here, who has never lived through an Alaska winter, who doesn't have to make a living here, who's not raising kids here, screw them, you know? I mean, preserve your own space. Of course, we weren't hungry for grandeur. We weren't hungry for, for vast open spaces. We had them. You know, that's what we had plenty of. What we didn't have plenty of was decent high schools, flush toilets in bush villages, you know? Those are nice things, too. Environmentalists weren't the only obstacle. Even without the lawsuits, the Interior Department would still have to approve the project. And as early as 1969, their geologists had serious doubts about the pipeline engineering plan. One of them was Art Lockenbrook. The advocates of the pipeline were pushing very hard for approval. And they hadn't demonstrated whether the pipeline, as proposed, would work. The oil men planned to build the Alaska pipeline the same way they'd built every other pipeline in the world. Dig a ditch and bury it. Lockenbrook warned federal officials that this would not work in the Arctic. Beneath a thin insulating cover of tundra and vegetation, much of Alaska sits on permanently frozen ground called permafrost. In some places, it's mostly gravel but in others, it's mostly ice. If ice-rich permafrost is allowed to thaw, it turns into loose mud that cannot support any weight. Prudhoe Bay oil would come out of the ground hot. And as it flowed through a buried pipe, it would thaw any ice-rich permafrost along the way. The unsupported pipe would eventually buckle break apart and start leaking oil. Lockenbrook's warning reached the Secretary of the Interior, who put the oil companies on notice. And I can guarantee that we will not approve any design based on the old faulty concept of build now and repair later. And the next Monday, my office was full of pipeline people. And that, uh, led to a very intense discussion that went on for over three years. The oilmen had formed a company called Alieska to design and build the pipeline. That job now entailed drilling 15,000 soil samples along the route to locate all the areas of ice-rich permafrost. As it turned out, more than 400 miles of the line would have to be built above ground. By the summer of 1973, the government was satisfied that the permafrost problem had been solved, but environmentalists still had the pipeline tied up in court. Worried about oil spills from tanker traffic along the coast of southern Alaska, they were now pushing for consideration of an alternate route through Canada to the upper Midwest, a process sure to cause years of further delay. pipeline advocates were fed up. They began promoting special legislation that would prohibit any more legal challenges. We are uh, on the course of, uh, of closing off judicial review by the environmental extremists who do not want any development in the North. The oil industry has used a campaign of several months, uh, ads on the television, newspaper, ads, full page, everything they could use, including the grossest intimidation of the members of the Senate. This was a showdown fight. When it came to a vote, the Senate was deadlocked at 49-49. 
Vice President Spiro Agnew cast the deciding vote in favor. With the vote so close, there was still a chance it might not be approved by Congress. But another conflict was about to intervene. October 1973. In retaliation for American support of Israel in the Yom Kippur War, Arab states declared an embargo on oil shipments to the U.S. The price of oil doubled overnight. Shortages led to gas lines, gas rationing, and sometimes no gas at all. Pipeline supporters said that Prudhoe Bay would produce two million barrels of oil a day, cutting imports by one third. We're importing too much oil from abroad. We're importing this year 35% of all our oil. Now that is bad. It's bad from a diplomatic point of view because it subjects the United States to blackmail. And the man in the street wants to ask, well, if we can import it from the Middle East and every other place in the world that's substantially insecure, why can't we import it from Alaska? In November 1973, the Trans-Alaska Pipeline Authorization Act passed the House easily. There could be no further legal challenges. It took an act of Congress to end the battle, but the years of lawsuits produced volumes of environmental safeguards, which now had the force of law. For the oil industry, the price of victory would be more scrutiny and regulation than they'd ever faced before. The energy panic put enormous pressure on Alyeska to get the pipeline built quickly. But the pressure from their oil company owners was even greater. They had already spent billions at Prudhoe Bay, and they were losing $22 million a day in revenue while the oil sat in the ground. They made it clear to Alyeska that the pipeline had to be up and running in three years, no matter what. The popular rumor was that if we didn't start it up on schedule, so Ohio was in danger of having to declare bankruptcy within 30 days. This had taken some of the giant oil companies, some of the biggest oil companies in the world, like Standard Oil, British Petroleum, and stressed their financial um, wherewithal to the absolute limit. The first job was to build a supply road through the trackless northern half of the state, from the Yukon River just north of Fairbanks to Prudhoe Bay, and then 29 construction camps along the pipeline route to house the workers. Alyeska finally went to work at the end of January, 1974. They had to haul in road building equipment and temporary housing while the ground was still frozen. By spring, the tundra would be too soft to drive on. Cargo planes flew in more freight, landing on frozen lakes. By fall, the 360-mile-long gravel road was finished, and the race was on to be ready for construction the following spring. Three million tons of pipe, machinery, spare parts, fuel, and food would be hauled in over the next two and a half years. It was just bumper to bumper traffic. It was pretty much insanity. Didn't really pay to pass the guy ahead of you. Well, I was living on the road back then, just one trip after another. We didn't have a scale, we didn't have log books. Virtually just lived in the trucks and ate in the camps. I'd get into town and just load and go. If you'd met another truck and didn't know he was coming, if you just clicked your mirrors, you'd call that a good pass. And the motto then was crowd the other guy, not the ditch, because you'd end up over in the ditch, laying on your side. It's a long way down a lot of spots.
At the end of March 1975, it was time to start laying pipe. No one had ever attempted construction on this scale in such an extreme environment, under such intense scrutiny, or on such a tight schedule. The only hope of finishing on time was to divide the route into five segments and build them simultaneously. The man in charge of getting it done for Aliesco was Frank Moulin, a veteran big project engineer who had just finished BART, San Francisco's rapid transit system. He was a tireless worker who knew how to motivate. And he kind of got the feeling like, if you didn't do your part, this whole thing was going to fall apart. You know, there's you know, 20,000 guys working on this thing, you know, but, um, but that's the way you felt when you talked to Frank. And you felt like uh, you, um, you didn't want to let him down. No one worked harder than he did. Friends believe his relentless style contributed to an early death not long after the pipeline was done. He was a totally driven individual, extremely bright, very demanding. If it hadn't been for Frank, it wouldn't have happened. Moulin would live in a helicopter for the next two years, trying to keep the sprawling, complicated project on track. There were hundreds of streams and rivers to cross. 12 pump stations to build, plus a tanker port on the coast at Valdez. And then there was the pipe, 800 miles of it, to be welded together 40 feet at a time. If the ground was stable, it could be buried like any other pipeline. But 420 miles of the route passed through unstable permafrost, where the pipe would have to be built above ground and then insulated to keep the oil fluid in cold weather. Nothing like it had ever been done before. The massive scale of the operation made everything more difficult. Housing, telephones, electricity, everything was just in short supply or no supply. They just sapped up all the equipment that was available. It was just like that. I've hired aircraft, spent $10,000 to go get a $50 item for a Caterpillar tractor to get it started so we can keep moving. How many dollars a day were they spending? $30 million a day, $20 million a day? And the production is being held up because of a widget? You know, it doesn't matter what it takes to get the widget, go get the widget. The one thing not in short supply was people hoping to cash in on the project. Working seven days a week, 10 or 12 hours a day, pipeline workers earned three or four times what they could make anywhere else in the country. 40, 60, 80, 800, 20, 40, 60, 80, June of 1975. I opened up my Time magazine and there was an article on the Alaska pipeline and it had a picture of a fellow on the pipeline showing his check to the camera. And that check was about $1,500 for a week. And I made $1,000 a month. I was a school teacher. I had four children. We didn't have enough money to live on. I looked at that picture and I said, that's me. Verna, that's my wife, we're going. Thousands of people got the same idea. It was like a gold rush. We had people from almost every country and from every walk of life. It was the last of the frontier. Those of us who were here got a chance to live through the, probably the last American frontier. Fairbanks was a boom town jammed with pipeline workers spending money as fast as they could. It was like a circus every night. People coming into town with three, four, five thousand dollars in cash in their pockets. Suddenly women that we'd never seen around town before were appearing from places like uh, Florida and New York and uh, suddenly we had reports of gambling going on and I mean everybody who could had some piece of that pipeline. 
We know for sure that major organized crime figures looked at it as an opportunity. Nevada, who cares about Nevada? We got 25,000 construction workers earning 100,000 bucks a year in a place where there are 10 men to every woman. You know, you don't exactly need an MBA to figure that one out. Fairbanks was a brief stop for the majority of pipeliners. Most were shipped off to one of the construction camps out on the line. Living in a pipeline camp. Living in a pipeline camp. Current weather at Chandelar. Winds are calm. Visibility is 15 miles. But I've come up here to make some big money and pay off my bills behind. Well, it's good living, like I told you. You got good maid service, everything is clean, clean life. I never lived like that all my life. There were a lot of people who felt like, I mean, this is the good life. It was definitely exciting, but it was really tough. It's tough for a woman, for one. Thousands of women got into construction for the first time on the pipeline thanks to affirmative action requirements in the federal permit. I've been here for about two years, working on and off, driving buses, flatbeds, whatever they'll put me on, whatever I can drive. I'm your typical teamster. I came to the pipeline because the job was offered to me, and at the time, I wanted to know if there was anything I could do besides being a mother and a wife. Frankenblush was one of the biggest camps, and I took a count one day, and I've always remembered the number, 1,100 men, 97 women. And uh, those are pretty good odds for some and pretty poor odds for the others. Diane Benson was a Clinkett Indian from southeast Alaska who joined the Teamsters and lived in pipeline camps for three years. Camp life was being in a shower and having a guy walk in on you to do his laundry or walking down the hall and having a guy grab you. It was also dealing with things like eating in the mess hall one time, eating chicken, and you know, and you gotta eat it with your fingers, and all the guys staring at me at the table as if that was the most erotic thing they'd ever seen. It was hard to be a woman up there and try to maintain your dignity if you had any, you know, or wanted any. But this was one big adventure, and I loved it. I said, you could pay me a dollar a day and give me a room and board, and I would be happy to do this job, because I loved it that much. Alaska was booming for lots of people. But for many latecomers to the gold rush, it was a bust. Pipeline work was supposed to go to Alaska residents and people with special skills first. The rest went on the waiting list. There was a line at the Teamster hiring hall that was about five blocks long. You go to the labor's hall, it was the same thing. You go to the operating engineer's hall, it was the same thing. Well, that was discouraging because there was no chance, they said. There's at least 2,000 in this area signed up, 2,000 in the Anchorage area on the waiting rolls. And uh, most of these, like I say, I don't think will make it. They haven't got the financial resources to stay here an extended length of period, and they will be what you might call starving out and heading back down south. I can't find nothing whatsoever, and uh, here I am just stranded up here, and it can't move either way. And um, so it's, uh, it's a situation that uh, I hope nobody else comes up here looking for work because it's a bad situation. Uh, there's nothing here, and uh, so I just made a wrong move. That's about it. One day, Al Fleming heard that a bribe to the right person at the Teamster Hall could make a difference. It was said that this fellow would, for an amount of money, uh, backdoor you through the union so you get a job. That was what I was told. And so I decided I would go down there and meet this guy. Fleming offered his first two weeks pay, and within a few days he had a job in the Teamster warehouse in Fairbanks. Well, it changed my life. Everybody made $1,000 or more a week. $1,000 a week? In 1975, I thought, I'm gonna buy the whole state. By late summer 1975, 
there were 27,000 workers on the job. And Frank Moulin was determined to have 400 miles of pipe in place by the end of the year. The critical and highly skilled job of welding pipe was the exclusive domain of the Pipeline Welders Union Local 798 out of Tulsa, Oklahoma. 798 for short. They were a close-knit clan who guarded their turf jealously. A lot of people can weld, but can you make that perfect weld every time, every day, 10 hours a day, month after month after month? It'd be like penmanship. You got a lot of people that can write real pretty, then some people can't, they can just write to get by. That's, that's the difference. To make a good pipeline welder, you've got to have that penmanship. Well, the quality of the work and welding was better on this job than any job I've ever been on. It had to be. It was inspected more, and they expected more of you. It was uh, publicized. It was a big thing, and uh, everybody was looking down your throat. 798ers were notorious, not only for their skill, but for their attitude. They were the highest paid and most demanding workers on the job. The stories preceded them. Very, very talented, very, very arrogant, insisted on their own way. 798ers knew they were good. They knew that we couldn't build this thing without them. And they pushed it a little bit. Prima donnas in Alaska, that was a word they used a lot. I know there was a saying up there that happiness was an oaky flying south with a Texan under each arm. <laughs> so I guess they was referring to, to us, you know. The welders controlled the pace of the work, so whatever they wanted, they got. Winter was coming, and Frank Moulin knew that staying on schedule would get harder as the temperature dropped. You know, Alaska's got some of the worst environmental and weather conditions in the world. It's not unusual to get down to minus uh, 45, minus 50, minus 60 degrees in wintertime. With a little luck, they could work into December before the conditions became impossible. Alieska provided Arctic gear and some training in how to use it. But nothing could prepare a person for the North Slope, where the sun never rises for two months in the winter, and wind chill temperatures can reach 115 below zero. The first time I landed in Prudhoe Bay, it was a spooky place. You didn't see much out the window. There was, it was dark. And then you started seeing down below some lights and maybe a flare. This was the end of the earth. We've got our parkas on, some sort of face mask to keep you from getting frostbite. We're getting ready for battle out there in the elements. They were saying in Prudhoe Bay that the wind never blows, it sucks. When you're working at night on the North Slope, the wind's usually blowing, the snow's usually blowing. Communication is marginal, and the smoke from the diesel engines, the cold, the chaos. It was surreal. And we continued that for 10, 12 hours. And I am sure by the end of the night, everybody wanted to quit and just go home. On the southern half of the line, workers could drive to nearby towns after work. But north of the Yukon River, there was nowhere to go. You do get a closed-in feeling here because, like I said, this is it. These three or four acres right here, and this is all I see every day. Camp life got to be repetitious. 
You'd get up at the same time every day, you'd hit the same bus with the same hands, you'd head out to the same work site, day after day, seven days a week. I did a 20 week stint uh, one time, and, which was pretty hard to do. Drugs and alcohol were prohibited in construction camps, but the rules were rarely enforced. I actually would bring booze into the camp. I'd bring trunk loads of it. I'd fly it in and, or truck it in, and then I set up a little operation where I was actually bootlegging whiskey, and it was amazing to me. I kept pretty good records of this, and I might spend uh, six bucks on a bottle of R&R, and I'd turn around and sell that for about $25. But the demand was huge and I took advantage of that. You could tell what union somebody belonged to by what drug of choice they had. I mean, it seemed like operators were the drunks or the teamsters were the coke freaks and the laborers were the potheads. It got to the point where we had whole crews that would get loaded together, especially when you're working night crew. Drugs and alcohol weren't the only threats to productivity. All along the line, there were equipment shortages, breakdowns, design changes, and unexpected encounters with permafrost. Workers often sat on buses for days with nothing to do while the engineers tried to solve problems and deal with the state and federal inspectors who monitored every step of the process. Something like, you know, 18 different agencies were represented and every one of them had the ability to stop work because they had a question about what you were doing. The project was also plagued with theft of everything from tools and food to pickup trucks and heavy equipment. Much of it disappeared from North Star Terminal, the Teamster-controlled facility where Al Fleming worked. A lot of things that were supposed to go up north or go down south somewhere never made it, never made it. There was always talk that there was organized crime throughout the pipeline. And there was always talk that it permeated the union that I was part of, the Teamsters. One of the union leaders was murdered. The rumor was that it had to do with drugs. The 798ers were busy living up to their reputation, tearing up mess halls, brawling with security guards, and alienating just about everyone else. Some believed that Frank Mullen and his managers were losing control. I can tell you what people on the street thought was that it was a joke, that it wasn't exactly management. It was just, um, you know, if you throw enough pickup trucks at this thing, sooner or later, one will make it up the hill. Certainly there were excesses, certainly there were things that went wrong, certainly there was chaos. But when you try and put a project together like this, you're undoubtedly going to make mistakes and have problems. It was kind of like a, a small war without guns most of the time. <laughs> Somehow, though, the pipeline was getting built. Alieska had negotiated no strike clauses with the unions. What they gave in return for high wages and tolerance for a certain amount of bad behavior. They bought labor peace. They wanted to build the damn thing fast. They didn't want labor troubles, and they were willing to pay for that. And I would say this about it, it worked. Despite incredible feather bedding, despite incredible waste, despite incredible theft, in the end, enough guys showed up with enough muscle and blood to build a pipeline. And so, simply seen as a feat both of, of engineering and construction and project management, you'd have to say uh, it was a moonshot. In mid-December 1975, extreme cold forced welding crews off the line for six weeks. 371 miles of pipe was in place, just short of Moulin's 400-mile target. So far, they'd beaten back every challenge with money and brute force. But a new crisis was about to hit, and this one threatened to take down the entire project. Early in 1976, the national media reported that thousands of welds made in the previous year might be fatally flawed. 
The Transportation Department, which sets safety standards for all pipelines, opens new hearings tomorrow on the trouble-plagued Alaska pipeline. Those troubles threaten the fragile Alaskan environment, the timetable for delivering new oil to the rest of the country, and the price of that oil. Every one of the 108,000 pipeline welds was supposed to be x-rayed, inspected for flaws, and certified. An enormous task that quickly overwhelmed the companies hired to do the job. One of the subcontractors got behind and pulled a trick that had been learned in the industry long before, is that you find a good weld and you x-ray it 10 or 15 times from a different angle and then call it 10 or 15 different x-rays and say, well, the next 15 joints are in good shape, now we can move ahead and you get caught up. When the deception came to light, it was a major scandal and Congress demanded answers from those in charge. It was disastrous because it threw the whole quality control program and quality assurance program for everything on the pipeline into question. And it was like, well, if something as simple as an x-ray, you know, can't get done right, what, what else is buried? Until Frank Mullen's people could sort out which x-rays had been faked, all 30,800 field wells to date were under suspicion. By laboriously cross-checking every x-ray, they were able to find all the duplicates and narrow the number of suspects to 3,955. More than half were in buried pipe, some beneath rivers. When you're already schedule-driven, you've got every resource stressed. All right, now you're going to go out and dig up hundreds of existing places and x-ray them and re-weld them if you have to. And in the case of several river crossings, actually go back in a couple of miles under a river and look at the well. In the end, some 1,900 welds needed minor repair. Another 37 had to be cut out and redone. It was an expensive and embarrassing setback. But the schedule suffered the most damage. To get the oil flowing in 1977, they had to finish welding pipe before winter set in at the end of 1976. And that was looking more and more doubtful. The owners told Frank that he could spend up to an additional $10 million a day as long as what he spent it on would save a day. Two of the most difficult sections remained. The rugged mountain passes of the Brooks Range in the north and the Chugash Mountains in the south. In the Chugash, the problem was the roller coaster terrain and the difficulty of getting machinery and pipe where it had to go. One spot in particular presented problems that no one in the pipeline business had ever confronted before. The near vertical 2,800 foot south face of Thompson Pass. I was called in for a brainstorming session on how do we do this. That's when uh, Frank Mullen said, we don't know how we're gonna build Thompson Pass. You gotta be kidding here, you know? It's that steep and there's no way to get stuff up and get stuff down and you can't even operate a cat on it, you know, and all of this sort of thing and we haven't figured out how we're gonna do it. Eventually, the engineers came up with a tower and cable system to fly the 80-foot pipe sections into place. The cable operators had to maneuver the nine-ton sections into position with nothing but radio communication to guide them. It worked well until the time came to position and weld the final sections on the steepest part of the slope, at which point the welders balked. One man had already been injured by a falling rock, and most of the others decided it was too dangerous to continue. With time running out, the managers turned to Junior Leslie, one of the oldest and most experienced welders on the job. At Thompson Pass, 
he saw a chance to repair the reputation of the 798 welders in Alaska. The superintendent come out and said, Junior, what are we going to do? And I said, well, nobody wants to go. I'll volunteer. And then a little welder named Richard Beanie came around and wanted to go. That, then that kind of broke it. When I did that, I didn't do it to be glorified or anything. I did it because it needed to be done. I did it for the union. For the next few weeks, Junior Leslie and Richard Beanie worked in a place where only rock climbers had ventured before. Yeah, every day you had the danger of the rock hitting you or the pipe getting loose and coming down on you. It's the most dangerous job I've ever seen. Snow, wind, uh, rain, anything, sleet, anything you could imagine. I felt like I was trying to uh, wash the windows on the Empire State Building. <laughs> They were taking their lives in their hands to work on it up there. That's what pipe runners do. It's probably one of the characteristics of 798 welders, <laughs> the good side. <laughs> on October 20th, the welders were done with Thompson Pass. Nothing to compare with this. They've uh, no mountain like Thompson Pass. This is a granddaddy. Like I said, that was a granddaddy in my home. 500 miles to the north, in the Brooks Range, they were still working on the last piece of the pipeline. Attigan Pass was the highest point on the line, 4,800 feet above sea level, with some of the most brutal weather in Alaska. We had from five to 700 men working 24 hours a day in Attigan Pass under some extremely difficult working conditions. Snowfall, very low temperatures, high winds. The ground was unstable permafrost, which normally would require elevated pipe. But the threat of avalanches meant that it had to be buried in a heavily insulated box filled with concrete. And they had to finish before the weather forced them off the line for the winter. So they're, they're pouring concrete in November in the Arctic. Cold, blowing snow, avalanche danger, just in terrible conditions. Working around the clock, they finished Attigan Pass in early December 1976. A little more than 20 months after work began, the 800-mile pipeline was in place. That's when you were getting the sense that, uh-oh, maybe I should have saved some of that money. No, it didn't, really didn't set me up. I just really lived good. You know, if I had a chance to do it again, I'd be set up. <laughs> you know how it goes. Oh, in the end, I, I banked $97,000 in cash in round numbers. First, all I wanted to do was just make money and then get out of here. That was the intent. But after about a year, I didn't want to go back because this, this became home. And it still is. I'm fiercely loyal to this place now. Funny how that works. <laughs> By late spring of 1977, the pump stations were ready to start moving oil. On June 20th, the valves at Prudhoe Bay were opened, and the first Alaskan crude began to flow south. The final cost was $8 billion, almost 10 times the original estimate. Frank Mullen was honored by his peers for pulling off the most complex and demanding construction job in history. A few years later, he died at the age of 48. The pipeline brought power to native Alaskans to the land claim settlement, though it brought less welcome change to some. Where people lived, the pipeline had a huge impact, and those people suffered a great sense of loss, not just of land, but of place. But the pipeline pulled Alaska kicking and screaming into the 20th century, and it allowed Alaska's native peoples to become a social and economic force in ways that I don't think ever would have been achieved, at least not for a long, long time. 
the pipeline has delivered some 15 billion barrels of oil so far, 50% more than predicted, though hardly enough to break America's dependence on foreign oil. There have been spills from accidents, vandalism, and thawed permafrost. And on the North Slope oil field, at least one from corrosion in the aging system. But overall, the pipeline has worked as well as almost anyone could have hoped. Alaskan oil has been the biggest resource bonanza in U.S. history, transforming the state from one of the poorest to one of the wealthiest in the nation. But Alaska has also paid a price. The disaster that some said was inevitable came in 1989 when the Exxon Valdez spilled a quarter million barrels of oil, 11 million gallons, into Prince William Sound. It was the largest, most destructive oil spill in U.S. history. They call it the Trans-Alaska Pipeline System. It is a system. And if any part of the system fails, it's a reflection on all of us. The people at Alyeska really took that hard. I mean, it was a tragedy. It's still not completely recovered. Um, we all took it very, very personally. The Exxon Valdez oil spill really changed public thinking about how safe was safe enough. In some ways, it's a shame for the pipeline builders because they did do a, a very good job of adapting to the new needs of environmental quality, spending more money, changing the design, but it's also the political reality. We're right back to the same debate. Is the oil crucial or is the wilderness crucial? I remember one morning looking at the line and the way it just cut a path right through the heart of Alaska. It felt like it cut across my heart sometimes to stand on the hillside and look at what it did to this place. On the other hand, you had to appreciate what a magnificent thing it was to build this thing. We were actually proud of it. Alaska is now an oil state. It's an oil colony, I think, fair to say. I know you'd find lots of Alaskans who thought that, that was the beginning of the state standing on its own feet and finding its destiny and being able to pay for its own future. I think you'd find an equal number um, who would think something very special was lost when Alaska put all its eggs in one basket. The pipe did exactly what it was supposed to do. And whether you consider that good or bad, it's the case, and it has changed the face of Alaska forever. Stay tuned for scenes from the next American experience. But first... This is what we were. This is where we've been. This is who we are. The hope still lives, and the dream shall never die. This is our experience. The American experience. There's more about the Alaska Pipeline at American Experience Online. Learn more about welding, pumping, and safety. See video flyovers before and after construction. Compare the pipeline to others worldwide. All this and more at pbs.org. American Experience's The Alaska Pipeline is available on video cassette or DVD. To order, call PBS Home Video at 1-800-PLAY-PBS. Next time on American Experience. Ultimately, along the way of life, an individual must stand up and be counted. Courage in the courtroom and on a bus in Montgomery. Two individual acts that sparked a fight to make America be America for all its citizens. The first episode of the landmark series that's been called a must-see for every American. Eyes on the Prize, a special presentation of American Experience.
Welcome to the future. PBS Digital. Alaska, 1976. The welders from Oklahoma were ready to quit. The last thousand feet of the Alaska pipeline had to scale an almost sheer cliff. It looked impossible. And no one was willing to risk his life on that rock face. Until the oldest man on the job volunteered. I was scared. Man, everybody else was scared too. But I was gonna go if I lost my life. After so many of them tell me it can't be done. On the Alaska pipeline, there was always something that couldn't be done, that had to be done. It was an 800-mile steel pipe through the heart of America's last untouched wilderness. The biggest, most expensive, nuclear-powered submarine tankers and 12-engine jumbo jet tankers. Eventually, they agreed that the only practical solution was a pipeline. The shortest route would run 800 miles to the heart of Alaska, from Prudhoe Bay on the northern coast to the Port of Valdez in the south, equivalent to building a pipeline from Minneapolis to Oklahoma City, but with an Arctic wilderness in between. It was country so wild, some of it had never been mapped. The pipeline would cross three mountain ranges, 800 streams and rivers, and some of the world's most active earthquake zones before reaching the ice-free water in the south. It was an audacious plan, even for the oil industry. The industry was somewhat beyond confident, but they had the know-how and the money to solve any engineering problems they encountered they believed. And when you think of that kind of, of confidence, it, it does border on arrogance and, and it does border on hubris given what happened next. The building for years had reached critical mass. Now, they were ready to fight. The timing could not have been better for the new environmentalists, or worse, for the oil industry, which was on the verge of launching the biggest private construction project in history, in America's most pristine wilderness. Two years earlier, Atlantic Richfield struck oil at Prudhoe Bay on Alaska's North Slope. It was a massive strike, the largest oil field ever discovered in North America. Other oil companies joined in and started drilling their own wells. The biggest problem anyone could foresee was how to get 10 billion barrels of oil out of Alaska. There wasn't even a road within 400 miles of the wellheads. The Arctic Ocean was frozen solid most of the year. The oil companies considered ice-breaking tankers. Experience is made possible by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation to enhance public understanding of the role of technology. The foundation also seeks to portray the lives of the men and women engaged in scientific and technological pursuit. At the Scotts Company, we help make gardens more beautiful, lawns greener, trees taller. If there's a better business to be in, please let us know. Imagine what the world would be like if everyone did the right thing. Responsibility. What's your policy? American experience is also made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. On April 22, 1970, 20 million people marched in cities across the U.S. in the first Earth Day demonstration. A movement most controversial private enterprise in American history. There were times when it felt just militant about it. Yeah, oh, let's just blow this thing up, you know, let's make it stop. 
It was like a gold rush. We had people from almost every country and from every walk of life. Plus, along with that, you had gamblers and crooks and uh, ladies of the evening. I mean, everybody who could had some piece of that pipeline. This was not about details, man. It was about muscle. I don't care what it takes, do it. That was a pretty good answer to money questions. It was a pretty good answer to environmental questions. It was a pretty good answer to political questions. I don't care what it takes, do it. And the evidence would suggest they didn't care what it took, and they did it. American experience.